guys are talking. Brush two, 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 two guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two guys are talking. Brush two, two guys are guys are talking. Brush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hey, folks. Welcome. Dan, you there? Hey, hey, hey. I am here. <laughs> we are here. We, we did are it. Live. <laughs> we did right. it. I can't believe it. Okay, show over. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Good night, folks. That was incredible. Dan, you did an amazing job. <laughs> hey, so um, here we are, uh, John Kane, myself, and the amazing Dan Buxman, and this is the inaugural episode of 2GTR, aka Two Guys Talking Rush. Not Talking Rush Limbaugh, talking the band Rush. Uh, uh, as uh, as of late, someone had mentioned Rush Limbaugh. I'm like, Absolutely not. This is about my favorite band, and um, I think Dan's favorite band, The Magnificent Rush. Um, this is a show uh, for Rush fans by Rush fans, and um, it's uh, no one to make it any money here. Uh, we're just uh, kind of two uh, middle-aged geeks who love, <laughs> grew up, who, who, were, yeah. who were teenagers that love Rush that grew up. To, is that your case, Dan? I mean, what were you... What were you like? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. Uh, male, uh, male and teenage. So you know, we had we had that going for us, and uh, yeah, no, we're just we've been fans for decades, and uh, you know, this this is kind of our way, I think, of uh, you know, part of part of it is getting through COVID. But part of it is also like this was kind of inspired by uh, the band breaking up and uh, Neil passing. Uh, we wanted to kind of do something, uh, you know, the, to help sort of observe that. Uh, but mostly it's because we're sitting in our houses and uh, have Zoom. So here we are. It's sort of like a, uh, you know, a new age Wayne's world. You know, they're kind of. It's not. It's yeah. not uh, cable access, but it sort of is. You know, uh, we're getting out to the community, and uh, we're not in our basements, but we're hidden away somewhere where we won't be too embarrassed by uh, right. by others, like our wives, who think we're funny to be listening to Rush all the time. But that's that's cool. More more for me. More more for Dan. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm John Kane. Uh, this stream is going to Facebook Live on my page, uh, and then it's being shared to other Rush pages. It's just a kind of a starting point. Eventually, if we continue on with this, it'll go to YouTube. But uh, I think for now, where we have uh, a lot of fans of Rush who are friends that they might enjoy this conversation. Um, I uh, know Dan because we met because we've written, I've written a book on Woodstock. Dan has written a, a wonderful book on Woodstock, and we met uh, at Bethel uh, at the museum uh, last year for the 50th anniversary of um, of Woodstock. And and when we got together and first met, the, the first thing we talked about was Ronnie James Dio, which seems to make yeah. sense at a Woodstock. <laughs> which, yeah, we sniffed, we sniffed yeah. each other out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and my wife says, uh, you know, leave it to you to, to find each other at a Woodstock event yeah. to talk about Ronnie James Dio, which I think is hilarious. Um, but uh, We talked yeah. about Rush at that also, right? I think. We did talk about Rush. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. talked about it. Well, forget about it. If you meet, if you meet another Rush fan, the first thing I, I say is, like, what yeah. shows, what, what's the first Rush show you ever went to? And then right. that's it. It's like three hours of it's over. Of talk. Yeah, exactly. I, it's over. I know. You get to tear each other apart. You're like hugging each other at the end. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, um, I'm an, I'm currently an author. I'm, I'm writing a, a book now, uh, on the festival movement of the sixties and seventies. I have two books that I've written, uh, Pilgrims of Woodstock and 
uh, The Last Seat in the House, the story of Hanley Sound. So some people might know me because of my um, my uh, scholarly work in that area of uh, production, uh, elements of production revolving around sound in that uh, era of history. Um, and those people dwell within my, those Hanley people dwell within my uh, Facebook page as well. Dan, what, what about your books? I mean, you've worked on a number of your, your oh. you've been in, you've been a writer much longer than I have. And what have you, what, what have you talked uh, about your, well, my, your history? Okay. Um, well, my first book was uh, the Encyclopedia of Heavy Metal in 2003. I have it. Uh, then I wrote an art book uh, for this game, a uh, video game called Brutal Legend. Uh, but the book came out many years after the game because the game was not as successful as they thought it was going to be. Uh, I did the encyclopedia of new wave. Uh, I did a whole book of humorous quotes by famous people. And then I did, uh, Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did Woodstock, uh, 50 years of peace and music. And cool. the thing I was going to get started on after that was actually going to be, uh, book about Rush that I was collaborating with someone else on. But then uh Neil died, COVID happened, and that you know that so the project is kind of uh on pause at the moment. Uh and we do mean to get back to it, but you know, uh no one's <laughs> no one's taking book book pitches right now. So yeah uh, it's fair gonna be to a say, little time. Yeah, totally. I mean fair to say 2020 has been a terrible year. I mean it's just been That's, horrible. Yeah, it's a watch. Yeah, this is the worst year I can imagine that I've ever lived through. Yeah, for, for everybody. Yeah, I mean, uh, especially for Rush fans. Um, it's in, the only in, other I, year I can think of that was worse, maybe, was 1997, because Batman and Robin came out, and then Speed Two, Cruise Control came out a week later. Horrible moment for mankind. Was that Sch Schumacher's uh, uh, yes, Batman? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's what he yeah. introduced okay. nipples, nipples to Batman. We talked about that. That was the guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and rest in peace. He he passed this year too. So okay. Yes. Um, on that note, uh, but yeah, I mean, and not to not shed light on anybody that's lost a loved one because of COVID nineteen. I mean, it's it's been horrible, and I hope people are are healthy and staying safe and wearing masks and. And washing the hands, you know, it's it's still just mm -hmm. really just logical stuff. You know, stay away from large groups. Unfortunately, uh, large events. And I, oh man, I miss. I was watching some Rush videos, and I was actually watching watching some Aussie videos, uh, live performances of the No Rest for Wicked tour. And I think right. I missed that. Tour. I missed that tour, but just Ozzy had a way. Where I'm on. A, I'm talking about Ozzy on a Rush show, but the, the live event uh, arena, the arena, the smell, the people on top of each other uh, now is like yeah. horrific. But back then, man, I loved it. I loved arena rock and roll and, and music and Rush it did such a fine job uh, with the mm -hmm. art uh, and musicianship of, of all the production, just incredible uh, performance. We all know that. Um, but I wanted to say um, just a quick thanks to Billy Alexander, um, who's an award-winning guitar, songwriter, producer uh, for uh, John Waite, uh, Feel, Ron Blair, and Tom, Petty, his band, uh, Why Why Not, uh, are playing in the um, show opener, which uh, sounds really great. I think it just fits perfectly uh, in the intro. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to Billy. And um, you can check out uh, his band, Why Why Not uh, Band. It's whywhynotband.com. And they are just great. I mean, they have original music and they play a lot of Rush covers and they do it masterfully. And they have a female a woman singer and that's we've talked about tribute bands before yeah. well they're not really a tribute band but just the female voice within the uh spectrum or, or landscape of, of rush music really fits in wonderfully almost in the vein of like led zeppelin having an all female uh, led zeppelin makes sense you know uh in a yeah. lot of ways but i i guess you know we've t we've talked about having a future show about tribute a tribute band or tri just di various tribute bands of rush there are so many um, and yeah. just talking with them and talking about their passion. Again, it's all rooted in the fans. You know, there's nothing more than uh, a tribute band uh, who's a, those members are actually fans of, of the band to be able to do that. Uh, anyway, um, so I guess one of the questions, and, uh, you know, I can answer it, you can answer is, 
uh, why why a show about Rush? When I approached you about this, just out of the blue, I'm like, can I talk? To you? Can I talk to you for a second? You know, you know, and gave you this idea. Why why didn't you think I was nuts? Uh, most of us Rush fans. Our, our default state, our resting state in life is that all we want to do is talk about Rush. And we have had to learn how to hold that back among the public and among other people uh, who don't want to talk about it necessarily. But for you and me and for most Rush fans, it's all we want to talk about. And we could go on forever. Uh, you and I could never get off this existing uh, chat that we're doing right now and 12 hours later people could check back in with it you know and be like yeah but that fill isn't as good as this fill and i you know it's it's i'm 50 years old uh, if if this was just an adolescent thing i would have left it in the past a long time ago but i mean when i listen to them i still get just as excited about it as i did when i was younger uh i I don't think it's uh, an exaggeration to say that I, I love their music with my whole heart. Uh, and there's, there's no part of it for me that's, you know, that I put it on and it's like, eh, I don't, yeah, it's okay. This isn't what I want to listen to. You just, you're, you're there, you're part of it. And there are just very few bands I can think of uh, that have had that kind of an effect on me. And that to this day, uh, I still feel that strongly about and still get that wrapped up in the music when I hear it. Uh, like, you know, the song Xanadu, I've probably heard 10 million times. And every single time I hear it, that, that 11 minutes is blocked off. I'm, that's what I'm doing right there and then. And uh, I never get tired of it. Um, their music also, uh, you can appreciate it on a lot of different levels. So the older you get, you you find new things and you you hear them in different ways. They maybe didn't necessarily hear them the first time. Uh, you know, like when I was when I was younger, I liked like you know the harder edge stuff and didn't really like the later stuff. I've sort of come to appreciate the later stuff that I didn't like as much. You know, part of it just because I'm older. Um, but that's baked into their music, you know, because they're such good musicians and everything is so well thought out. Mm -hmm. um, you do, there's, it's not like something you listen to a few times and get bored and then you never listen to it again. There's so much going on uh, that it can really sustain you for years. That's how it is for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of that same sentiment uh, in there for me as well. I think, you know, I would subdivisions, you know, I'll never, I'll, I just will never get sick of that song ever. I, there's nothing about it that mm -hmm. is just like, it's just a masterpiece, you know, and then, you know, then I think, wait, there's another, you know, Limelight, I never get sick of Limelight, and then I right. think, wait, there's another, you know, that's the thing with Rush, uh, they really uh, have uh, struck a chord with me, um, and um, I'm not ashamed to say that they're my favorite band, you know, when, you know, a 50, it, me, I'm closing on 50 as well, and to say that I'm a 50-year-old with a favorite band, I think, well, I am, you know, Rush are my favorite a favorite band and um, they have been for a long time i think the first show i've seen we've talked about this i mean there are rush fans that have seen them you know umpteen times you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. i saw them i think i've seen them about 35 times i have to count my stubs but uh i was you know 16 or 17 when i saw the hold your fire tour and that that album uh and i won't go too much off on the tangent here but to have that album uh at a time where a lot of the Rush fans by 86 or 87, that former generation were into the harder edged, maybe uh, longer song versions of Rush, the, the uh, you know, the 2112 generation, you know, by the eighties, there was a lot, there was a whole new crowd, but to, even to have that album um, and those songs on that album touch or strike a chord for a 16 year old, it's kind of, kind of, weird i mean they really crept in to my head um you know lyrically and um and um uh, their musicianship was just so noticeable you know i think being a musician i recognize that um as well yeah. but uh today is bastille day and i don't know we did this on purpose uh we were thinking about this for months now and so let's have our let's comfortably take our time with this and uh, we'll launch the first show on bastille day and i'm i'm you know i'm 
I know a lot about history, but I don't know everything. So I had to look up a lot of things. And did you do any research on Bastille Day or what do you know about Bastille Day or, or it relating to uh, Neil writing the song? Uh, there were a lot of beheadings. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, it was the beginning of the French Revolution. And exactly. uh, it gets... Uh, a, the time we're going through right now in America politically, uh, the people who are not happy about what's happening uh, will invoke the French Revolution, like, you know, like this was a bad thing that happened. Um, you know, people who are kind of more, you know, law and order, you know, that sort of thing. But, yeah. uh, you know, the, the French Revolution was, uh, Marie Antoinette was wrongly said to have said, let them eat cake. And that's not that's not exactly what she said. She was told uh, the peasants are rioting because they don't have any bread. And so she went, oh, can't they eat cake? So it, there was this kind of disconnect, you know, from the people in the ivory tower and everyone down in the gutter. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, violence is wrong, as we all know. But, you know, it, uh, there was a tipping point. The French Revolution was a tipping point. And I think if you live in Canada, uh, especially in the, like in a French speaking province or something like that, but you know, that's, that's how you're, you know, we, we were brought up with the American revolution and George Washington and all that sort of thing. It's different there, even though they're a close neighbor. Right. And, uh, they, they just get more of that kind of history than we do. Uh, for us in the United States, I think there are a lot of people who don't even know that there is a Bastille day unless they listen to Rush. So. This is the thing about Rush is that, you know, you're getting a history lesson. We've, you know, yeah. we've, uh, and, and I think that's why you either love or hate the band, but uh, boy, uh, they deliver it uh, amazingly. And uh, here it is. So Bastille Day, a song uh, uh, that's the opening track in their third album, Caress of Steel. Great album, but not, probably not one of my favorite albums by Rush, but I think it's, it's known that uh, this was the album pre- uh, 2112 uh, right. that kind of set them up for uh, that incredible album. Uh, music written I, by. I like it. I mean, it's just I, it's a it's a it's transitional different. album. It is. It yeah. is a transitional album. Yeah. Um, lyrics by Neil. Uh, the song the song uses the storming of the Bastille, which began the French Revolution, as an allegory for revolutionary fervor needed in the struggle against uh, tyrannical government. Um, and. Um, Maybe I could just show a quick clip of it. I don't know if Facebook is going to cancel cancel me out, but I don't care. Um, and uh, it's within a historical reference, so maybe it's uh, fair use in this case. Fair use, yeah. Yeah, so here we go. I'm going to show a clip of that. Let's see here. Oh man, <laughs> you could have just kept that going, and I'd be like, "Yeah, <laughs> I would, I would have." But uh, you know, I don't want to. Fair wanna use, show this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, fair, yeah. fair use, people. Facebook. I, uh, I get the feeling use. you and I are going to be saying "fair use" a lot during the show. Like, <laughs> we should just call often. this like show "fair use." Yeah, <laughs> fair yeah. use. Okay. <laughs> just fair use. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, anyway, uh, I, I, you know, it's so anthemic and just so uh, punctuated, and that. That's Rush, man. I mean, I, I, you forget yeah. that early Rush sounds like that sometimes. There's so many phases to Getty's voice, the complexity of the music, um, the energy of the music. Um, 
and that's just so that's what's so incredible of them. There's just so many types of of treatments, um, all complex, all uh, um, uh, incredible, but there's just different these different eras of Rush that you just you can go back and listen to that, and then you can go forward and listen to something different. You know, I yep. love that. Um, well, I, I mentioned to you before, uh, folks, uh, for all two of you that are watching the show. Um, I'm just joking. Hopefully, this, we have an audience. I don't even know. I haven't checked. Um, we will eventually. We'll song? conquer the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. But <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we hope to have uh, a diversified uh, offering of guests on the show. Um, who better to have uh, on uh, than um, than my dear friend uh, Donna Halper, who's been waiting? And but I did say eight twenty, and we're on target. So I'm going to uh, bring Donna Halper uh, in the room. And, and for any Rush fan, if you don't know who Donna Halper is, shame on you. All right, here we go. Donna, Let's see. you need to unmute. Unfortunately, there's all these buttons, and it's just like hit this one. We did that on purpose. There, oh, you have more you buttons go. than us. There you go. <laughs> so I've heard there's a couple of guys talking about Rush. Would you happen to know anything about that? The wrong Zoom room. This Not is wrong uh, Zoom. This room. Is, okay, yeah, I, this is a book. This leave. is a cooking show. This is a cooking oh, okay. show. Well, what's good? Hi, Donna. How are you? You know, I'm happy to be walking around. How about you? Doing well. And Donna, have you ever met Dan Buxman before? Donna, Dan. Nope. Dan, I give you a socially distant virtual hug. I I would just like to say, uh, having known your name for many many years in connection with this band, I am so happy to have you on our first show. I'm so happy you're involved, and I'm very, very grateful uh, that you could give us your time to do this, uh, because you probably know, well, you probably know at least what a couple of the questions are that are coming, and uh, have no, probably answered them. Money. And um, no, I'm not fabulously wealthy. <laughs> it was, was going to be more... just messaged me and said... I heard your name. What did you ever do with Rush? And wow. I'm like, what did wow. I do with Rush? I was like, okay. Hey. But then I have to remind myself, there are new generations of fans coming on board all yeah. the time. It's like I get down on people sometimes on social media when they'll mock someone. And I'll just be like, wait a minute. The person could be new to this country. They could be, you know, somebody just played something for them. They've never heard it before. I mean, seriously. I mean, just because we're all really into this, not everyone is. So let's bring them in, make them welcome to the family. So I answered and explained what my involvement with the band was. For all I know, the person is young, you know? I, I see that all the time. When I used to go to the concerts, and I've talked about this with John. Um, when I used to go to Rush concerts back in the 70s, it was nothing but white males and me. And, you know, the occasional girlfriend, okay? But by the 80s, it's starting to get more women fans. By the 90s, I'm seeing kids there, like their parents are fans. They apprentice their kids into it. By the 2000s, it's a family affair. It's like, let's go see a Rush concert. So, you know, there's just, it's amazing the staying power of this band. So forgive me if I sidetracked you, but like literally just before I came on the air, I was just checking my email and checking my social media. And there was this like, but who are you? <laughs> if 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 you're amenable to it, uh, I would just ask if for our vast audience, for whoever's out there who who may not know, if you could just give us, you know, the quick version of how you came to be associated with Rush, just for but, who may be Donna, out there and, let me, and let does me not. Donna, know. Let me give Donna a, a quick intro, and then you can answer that question, Donna. Um, is that okay? Absolutely, it's your show. Okay. Uh, Donna. Donna Halper is a Boston-based historian and radio consultant. Beginning in 1968, 
Halpa worked as a radio disc jockey and music director and is credited with discovering the progressive rock band Rush while at WMMS in Cleveland in 1974. I would like to add that, Donna, you were the first uh, female DJ at Northeastern, correct? That's correct. She has taught courses in broadcasting, media criticism, and media history, and is the author of a number of books, including the first uh, book-length study devoted to the history of women in American broadcasting, Invisible Stars, A Social History of Women in American Broadcasting. Donna, how did, how did you have, as springboarding off what Dan was asking, how did you discover Rush? Well, once upon a time in a kingdom far away, music directors could actually break new artists. And I was always a music director. Uh, it was one of the first jobs I had in college radio. I was also a DJ. But by and large, music director became gendered as a female position. But I always liked it. I always thought it was a very cool job. I mean, yeah, you assisted the program director, but you got to hear the new music before anyone. And I'm sure you guys are music junkies just like I am. So it was so cool having the new music come in and being able to listen to it before anyone. And then we'd sit down and decide what we were going to add for that week. And it was a whole world that I knew nothing about. I mean, I grew up with top 40. And I grew up listening to my favorite DJs. I mean, Arnie Ginsberg, God rest his soul, who just yeah, passed. Yeah, R.I.P. Arnie, yeah. I mean, he was my cultural hero, okay? I loved his show. But I had no idea how he played the records. I, I just figured that, like, he played the ones he liked. I had no idea that there were music directors and program directors. I mean, you're a kid. You're a fan. You don't know from any of this, okay? Just like a lot of fans that'll see a band like Rush, they see them at their best. What they often don't know is the five years that they had to struggle to try to get anyone to play them, the number of labels that turned them down. All of that stuff is like the behind the scenes inside baseball stuff that most people don't really know. They just know the end result. OK. Oh, my God. The person hit a home run. Yes. But they were in the batting cage for like seven hours. So the truth is that I started off as a music director, thought it was like the greatest job ever, had a lot of fun doing it. And when I went to WMMS in Cleveland, I took with me some of the friendships that I had made with record promoters. And um, I got to warn you ahead of time, uh, I generally talk with my hands a lot. And on Zoom, that's awful because we're like in a little box and my hands are going to keep coming up. But I apologize for that. I'm trying to behave myself and keep my hands down here somewhere. But anyway, um, so when I went to Cleveland, I had a number of friends already who were record promoters from other you know, various labels. Back in those days, for those that are new to this whole thing, you didn't just like go on YouTube and watch a video. There was no YouTube. You didn't just like stream the audio or stream the video. Hadn't been invented yet. It was kind of the stuff of Star Trek that, that you'd be able to do stuff like that. Um, so every week, record labels would send their representatives who were called promo men, and they were usually men. Later it became changed to like promo representatives. But the promo men would come to the station with their records, you know, RCA, CBS, whatever the label was, and they'd play them. And of course, all their records were hits, every one of them, according to them. But we would pick the ones that were the best. When I got the first Rush album. I got it in the mail. I did not get it from a local promotion person because Rush hadn't been signed yet. Usually, if a band hadn't been signed, we would maybe hear them in a club or, you know, we'd go see them. We'd recommend that somebody sign them. These guys are from Canada. How would I know who they were? I'm in Cleveland, okay? So I'm automatically curious because I get this record in the mail from a Canadian record promoter, Bob Roper, who I'm still in touch with, by the way, um, who had sent me stuff before and who basically sent me a note saying, 
we're not going to sign these guys. They're not ready for prime time. But I hear something. I really think they've got some possibilities. What do you think? And as I've told on many occasions, when I dropped the needle on working man, I knew immediately. Now, did I know we were going to be friends for 45 years? No. Had no idea. Didn't expect it. Didn't expect money for helping them. Nothing. Didn't even know I was ever going to meet them. When you're a music director, you do it because it's the right thing to do. You're picking the best songs for your station. If you ever get an interview, won't that be nice? But you don't expect that either. Okay? It's just kind of like you get up, you go to work, you do your job, you go home. So I bring the record down to Denny Sanders, who's on the air. Denny, you're going to love this record. It's a Cleveland record. You know, when I get up at seven, yeah, go to work at nine, got no time for a living. Yes, I'm working all the time. That was Cleveland. And as I told a couple of other people the other night, that also was me. I grew up in a working class family. Okay. I do not come from money. I do not come from like, oh, well, you were born to do. No, I wasn't. You know, first woman in my family to go to college, worked my way through school, scrubbing floors in rich white people's houses. I was a maid. I was a switchboard operator. Come on. So, I mean, the idea that you work real hard and you just feel like you got no time for a living. Okay, the line about, you know, drinking and partying. No, that wasn't me. But the line about working all the time, I said, this song is going to resonate in Cleveland because that was Cleveland. It was a factory town. And sure enough, everybody, people loved the song. At first, they thought it was Led Zeppelin, which I'm like, I don't think it sounds like Led Zeppelin. But people are listening through, you know, tinny transistor radios. We're not talking like splendid audio. You know, we're talking like whatever anybody happened to have around. And um, the moment I saw all the requests, I said, wow, you know, I think we got something here. And then we started playing Finding My Way. And we started playing a couple of other songs from the record. Long story short, they ended up coming to Cleveland, playing a gig. I met them. They seemed like really nice kids. And they were kids back then. Um, but what's, what's just amazing to me is the fact that this was in the spring of 1974. Here we sit in July. 2020 as we're doing this. I'm still in touch. I'm friendly with Getty's sister. I'm friendly with Getty. I email Alex. I'm friends with Neil's best friend, Craig. God rest Neil's soul. But I mean, I'm still in touch with the management. And there's, there's nothing. I mean, it's not like they have new records. I mean, they've retired. God bless them. They had an amazing career. It was a privilege to be a part of it. But my point is, if you had told me back in April of 1974 that I would be sitting here in July of 2020 talking about my relationship and my friendship with the band and their management, I would have said, what are you, nuts? I mean, come on, it's the music industry. People throw each other away all the time. I want something from you, I do you a favor, and then I don't know who you are, okay? I cannot tell you how many people I've known over the years that when they wanted me for something, oh, I was their best friend ever. And then as soon as they got whatever it was, you know, get some airplay, get, you know, an interview, get me backstage, never heard from them again. Oh, I'm sure of it. But Rush were never like that. They were the most down to earth. I say that to people. They look at me like, yeah, right, you're friends. But we weren't always friends. We weren't. And they were like nice and down to earth in 1974. They're nice and down to earth in 2020. Nothing's changed. And that's could, amazing. Could you, you use the word? That is? Could you use the word menches? Oh, they are definitely menches. Yeah, for those that don't yeah. speak Yiddish, mensch is one of these all-purpose Yiddish expressions. It's literally translated as a human being, but it carries the connotation of somebody who's decent, 
compassionate, kind, someone who cares about other people. And that's, yeah, that's them. Um, I've told people, and they didn't believe me, I've told people that Neil, God rest his soul, was very charitable. Most people don't know that about him because he ordered people not to talk about it. He wanted to give charity in secret, okay? And he was very willing to help people out. He just didn't want it on like the front page of the New York Times. And it had nothing to do with image. It was just, he was a very private person. But my point is all of the guys were always family men. They were always down to earth. And that didn't change when they had their umpty fumptieth gold record. It didn't change when they had a star on the Walk of Fame. It didn't char change when they were inducted into the Rock Hall. They were still, I mean, their families were right there with them. I mean, tell me what scandal there ever was about Rush. My point. We okay. used keyboards. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. played the <laughs> bass. They, they turned down the bass. license guitar. <laughs> Uh, Donna, you you are um, you've assumed this role uh, because so many fans want to get at Rush, uh, you know, rabid Rush fans, you know, true diehard fans, passionate fans, and you've assumed this role over the years as kind of this intermediary, this the in between, this liaison. This you know, you're like you're the you're the spokesperson for the band. You just have you you've been that way, and I think you've fulfilled so many people's dreams in that way where so a fan might want to meet Neil or might want to meet Getty, uh, but obviously they can't. Uh, but there, there you are and, and you're, you, you kind of uh, f fill in those secrets and behind uh, the stage curtain uh, uh, stories, you know, and that that's been very fulfilling for a lot of people I know that have met you. Well, all I've tried to do is just be a good friend to the fans because Rush changed my life. I'm sure Rush changed your lives too. My point is Rush has changed people's lives in so many different ways, okay? I mean, let's be honest. I had a successful career, but I wasn't particularly famous. I mean, most DJs are just... They're DJs. They're well known in whatever city they're in, and then they go on to the next thing, and you know, etc. But after I discovered Rush, and after I helped their career get started, and after I graduated from being their big sister, because after a while they didn't need a big sister, they got their confidence, they were out there, and then I just became someone who was a friend, and. That was an honor for me as well. Like I said, I've met so many wonderful people because Rush fans are like a community. They're like a giant extended family. I've said on social media, and you're nodding your heads because it's true. There are righties who are Rush fans. There are lefties who are Rush fans. There are liberals. There are conservatives. There are people who are really religious and read the Bible. There are people who are atheists and never read the Bible. And yet they're all united around the fact that this band speaks to them. So having had that experience and having known them for quite a while, I always felt like if somebody gets in touch with me, I'm kind of old school about this, if somebody gets in touch with me, shouldn't I be courteous and get back to them? And I mean, yeah, sure, 5,000 people get in touch at once, the chances are pretty good I'm not gonna be able to get back to all 5,000. But I try my best to respond. Now, some of the stuff fans ask me, I can't do it. I can't get you backstage, even when the guys were performing. That's like not comes not coming from me. It's coming from the management. They decide who goes backstage. It's not my bailiwick, okay? But I can certainly let them know that something they read online is a rumor. I got really, really offended by some of the stuff I read online after Neil died. You know, people claiming they were with him at the end and this and that. Like, no, you weren't. No, you're really, you're just like, just zip it, okay? I mean, he did not want his death to be a big circus. He did not want 
a whole bunch of like weeping and wailing. Absolutely, everybody mourns in their own way. But he was private. He wanted to be surrounded by the people he loved the most. And that was it. And no, there wasn't a reporter from Name 7 newspapers. There just wasn't, okay? Um, and so I would go online when I see people spreading this stuff and just basically tell them, like, just please, like, please don't, okay? And anytime there was a rumor at all, like there was a rumor online one time that the guys were getting back together. They're going to get a different drummer. And they, I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, Getty said very clearly that if there's no Neil, there's no rush. And that's another thing about them that's so unique. The fact that they were loyal to each other in a way that you don't see in rock and roll, okay? Um, you see it with people like Springsteen, who was very loyal to the E Street Band, okay? Uh, Rush were very loyal to each other in that regard. When Neil went off after his wife and his daughter died, um, and he went off on a motorcycle trip, and people didn't know even where to get in touch with him, uh, Getty was asked. Like, people were sending in tapes. Here's my tape. I'm a great drummer. Yeah, I know. And um, he said, right in beyond the lighted stage, I know you saw it. He said, if there's no Neil, there's no rush. And I knew when Neil's health forced him to retire, I knew that Alex and Getty would not reform Rush. I mean, if Keith Moon came back from the dead, nope, nope, not interested. Nope. Uh, Buddy Rich? So it didn't matter who it was. As far as they were concerned, they respected his decision. That was the other thing. Was, oh, there's animosity between them, and they haven't spoken in months. They went to each other's houses on a pretty regular basis, okay? So, yeah. So I kind of took on the role of when I see something, I would set it straight, find out what the facts were, and just let the fans know. If I, I made think Rush happy. ended up needing you, Donna. I think Rush yeah. ended up needing you in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I was also working with the management on some levels, too. You know, I'm yeah. not that yeah. important, but I mean, just we're all kind of friends here. And sure. if sure. I could help, I was willing to do so. I'd always talk to Peggy and, you know, she was the vice president of Anthem. And I'd always say to her, like, hey, do you want me? to go online and just put this to rest or put out this fire. And mm -hmm. she would always be like, yeah, sure, go right ahead, you know? And I think I've got a reputation for credibility. And I think I have a reputation for courtesy. I mean, I try. I, I can't, you know, again, the only time I just flat out have to say no to someone is when they're like, well, I've got a great tape here. Can you get it to the band? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, sure can't. Nope, can't do it. Um, because if I did for you, I'd have to do it for every single one of the 5,000 people who ask me this on a regular basis. So I just, no. But it's all about friendship. And I've tried to be a friend to the fans. And you know what? It goes both ways. Look at all the people that I've met because they're all fans of Rush. I've spoken at conferences, I've, you know, and as a result, people have kind of wrapped their arms around me too. I'm not everybody's favorite person. I'm not the kind of person you want to hang out with necessarily. But on the other hand, when you're a Rush fan, you're never alone. When you're a Rush fan, you've always got friends. And I never forget that. And I'm profoundly grateful for it. That's great. I think Donna, um, Go ahead, Dan. No, I think for a lot of people who are more on the outside, like who aren't necessarily fans, don't get that. That there's more, it's more than just that we like the music. Uh, it goes deeper than that. It's a richer thing than that. I mean, just, just now when you were talking about um, your relationship to the band, you did not sound to me like it was a professional relationship. You sounded to me like someone, like it's family. Like these are people who mean something to you, uh, and not just not just because of the music. Like it's been a very you know, and not just because of the amount of time either. Um, there's something real there, 
And like you were saying about them appealing to, you know, different kinds of people with maybe different kinds of ideologies or whatever, that all goes away. Uh, once the music starts and once you get on this topic, there is nothing else. And um, one other one other thing um, that you had said also that I wanted to get back to uh, about them being mensches, uh, I have never met them. I've never met anyone involved with the band, but it's it's easy to see even just from watching them perform or a quick interview or something like that. They're very down to earth guys. and they they didn't play games uh and they didn't engage in the kind of like rock star that you stuff that you were kind of alluding to a little bit that other people might um and true story honest true story okay so i'm at the rock and roll hall of fame and i'm backstage and every single time over the years that the band were asked like, how did you get started? And they were asked that question as often as I'd been asked it. And they were always courteous about it. And 99% of the time, they always give me a shout out. Now, they didn't have to do that, okay? What I did for their career, I did in the first five years of their career. After that, it was mainly friendship, okay? The only thing I did after the first five years of their career, when I actively tried to get them airplay and help them get a recording contract and, you know, this and that. But after that, but the only thing I did really that was directly involved with their career was if critics trashed them, which critics often did back then, I would call those critics, okay? And I would have a conversation with those critics. Um, or if a station wasn't playing Rush, I would call that station. You know I mean? Because by that time, it's like, we're friends, all right? And... So I'm at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's like years. Okay, we're talking 2012, 2013, all right? And I'm backstage, and Getty's mother is there. In fact, I have a picture on my Facebook page of uh, Getty's sister and Getty's mother. And Getty's mother calls Getty over in her charming accent, which I couldn't do in a million years, but I'll try. She's like, Getty. Getty and Getty comes running over. Yes, Ma, <laughs> you know, because he's a very good son. You know, did you thank Donna for all she's done for you? <laughs> and Getty looks at her like, yes, Ma, every single time I see her, you know. But that's just, it's, it's family. It's like they're grateful. They've always been grateful. They've always had the kind of compassion, the kind of love, the kind of appreciation that transcends a dollars and a cents relationship. So yeah, even after there was nothing further they needed from me, the friendship was still there. We see it beyond the lighted stage. Uh, a lot of their touring crew, a lot of those folks have been with them for, you know, several years. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. That doesn't happen all too often. Donna, mm -hmm. uh, switch, switching gears, uh, because we're, um, we're running short on time. Um, you uh, have been highlighted in a no, no, no. It's great, um, but you've been highlighted in a in a new um, animated video for the 40th anniversary of um, Permanent Waves uh, and the Spirit of uh, Spirit of Radio video by uh, created by Fantunes, an LA-based animation company known for its rock tribute videos. What, I want to show a clip of that, but how did they reach out to you, and uh, what's it like? Be animated. <laughs> I'm a cartoon. You're a cartoon. <laughs> yes. Or I'm in a cartoon. You know, my enemies would say I am a cartoon. But, well, uh, you are. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this was very Imagine My Surprise. And that's not like a humble brag. It's like, no, I never expected to be in it. But then again, I never expected to be giving a speech at the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I'm, You know, there's all kinds of stuff I never expected to be doing. And yet, there I was. Um the president of Fantoons, his name is David, reached out to me and said, we've got this concept. We do a lot of work with the band. And we've got this concept for a music video that we're working on. And it's animated, which made sense, given that they couldn't get Neil, unfortunately, for obvious reasons. But what's a great way to bring Neil back to life? 
animated, create a cartoon, create an animation. Suddenly, there they are again. And they decided to do a tribute, kind of like an homage to the history of radio and to Russia's role and the role of radio in their careers, sort of like the role of Rush and how radio played such a part in their success and how much radio meant to them even growing up, okay? The Toronto station they listened to as kids. They grew up with Top 40 just like I did. You know, they grew up with some album rock just like I did. And they wanted to do a cartoon, an animation, that was like a kind of a little history of broadcasting. And they wanted me in it because part of the video was about Russia's relationship to radio and what radio did for Rush. And they very kindly animated me. And there I was playing that first Rush album. So there was that. Uh, it was pretty amazing. I've never, you know, I never thought I'd be in a cartoon, but. Then again, would you like a long list of the things I never thought I'd do in my life? Well, there's, there's been sort of a, a, a whole new wave of interest in you uh, since that uh, video's come out. Well, let me let me show a clip and uh, hopefully, again, fair use. That's the name of our show. If, if two guys talking rush doesn't work. Um, let's see here. Bear with me one moment, please. Yeah, all of the DJs who were involved in promoting and playing Rush in those early years are remembered in that video, which I also thought was incredibly cool. But again, so cool. this is typical of the band. They don't forget. They always care about those who have cared about them. And they really do model that kind of behavior. They really do. And it's rare in the music industry or anywhere else for that matter. But Donna, you're a radio historian and you're yeah. in this kind of concept yeah. video about the history of radio relating I know. I know. to the spirit of radio. It's this weird multi-dimensional uh, thing. Yep. You know, it's very, yep. it's yep. very insane. Donna, do you still have that moon, uh, moon I label? You I do. do. I absolutely do. I don't have it don't, with me, uh, but I would never sell it for any amount of money. And if so you ever rare. have me back on your show, I'll bring the original. It's downstairs wrapped in plastic bubble wrap and a whole so host rare. of other things. OK, but no, what I was doing the other night uh, and I won't take up too much of your time. I know no, no, you guys no, go. got a schedule, but like it, the other it. night I was doing an interview with a uh, radio station in Brazil because there's all these Rush fans in Brazil. And I showed them this, okay? Now, you've never seen this before, I promise you, unless you watched my interview with the folks in Brazil. There's no reason you would know what it is. And what it is, is a diary from 1925. People were so crazy about radio that they would literally take notes. Like when they heard something, they'd write down what station they listened to, what they heard it on. I mean, they were just amazed. They couldn't believe it, okay? And years later, radio still would bring out that kind of reaction in people. You listened for your favorite song, you waited to hear your favorite DJ, and those are some of the childhood memories that Rush had that perhaps you guys had, and that I certainly had. And I had a tremendous amount of fun on the radio. I miss it. I miss it every day of my life. I mean, I'm glad that I went back to school. I'm the master of reinvention. I went back to college when I was 55. I got my PhD when I was 64. 
I work full time as a college professor. And yes, I write, I do research. I'm a media historian. I am also a cancer survivor six years now. So there's that. But um, the thing is, radio always had this reaction in people where it was just like, you know, maybe now they're not keeping diaries and writing it down, but I'll bet you there are still kids that are excited about the fact that they heard some song that they really liked or heard some DJ or went to some event and met some famous person. And the person may not even be nationally famous, but you don't know that. They're famous to you and that's what matters. So that's the spirit of the radio. And to some degree, that's what's been lost and it breaks my heart. Well, radio was really a lifeline to people. Uh, you know, especially earlier in the 20th century, like what you're talking about, uh, you know, it was you would see all those pictures of the families sitting, you know, sitting around the gigantic radio yeah, that was yeah, in the I middle of the living room. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That, that was life. That was it. Um, you know, now I, everything's on here. Yep. Uh, you know, all the music I could possibly want is on my phone. I have no connection to, you know, what this station is playing or what this station is playing. And we totally take it for granted today uh, yeah. that you can just have whatever you want right when yeah. you want it. And it, it was that that prevents you, I think, from developing that kind of emotional connection that you're talking about. Because if you can just and get also, it on, we on no demand. longer have as many live and local radio stations because of the Telecommunications Act of 1994 and um, 96. The Telecommunications Act created an environment where stations were getting bought and sold and gobbled up by giant corporations. And yeah. pretty soon you had like six giant companies owning all the radio stations. And what used to be a community exercise, like every city had a local radio station. And now there's an awful lot of cities where there's no local station. And kids are growing up without that tie to the local DJ or the local community. Yeah, they're beginning the day with a friendly voice. And the friendly voice might be 300 miles from there and may not know anything about their city. And I think I said the Telecommunications Act of 94. It was 96. I have 94 on the brain for another reason entirely. But be that as it may, the bottom line is we now have an entire generation who when you and I talk about radio, they're like, yeah, I, exactly. asked, I asked my students last year when I was teaching media history, how many of you listen to radio? And maybe two hands went up. When I was growing up, every hand in the room would have gone up. They would have been fighting with each other to work at the college radio station. Mm -hmm. Sad. I listen to radio every. I listen to radio every day, and so do I. I do. So do yeah, I. and I do, and I think I do it for pure nostalgia. I, I, as a little kid, I was so uh, enamored by the technology of radio, being able to extend an antenna, and at night, especially at night, you know, shortwave AM, and kind of just turning the dial and just oh, yeah. trying to capture adventure. stuff. It was, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there was a lot of, we also used to do something called broadcast band DXing because a lot of radio in those days was on AM. AM was music back then. It wasn't talk or sports or whatever, it was music. And if you listened at night, AM signals traveled very, very far at night for reasons that I didn't understand. I just knew that they did. And I'm sitting in Boston and I'm listening to radio stations in Baltimore and Kansas City and Florida and I'm like is there this much wonderfulness in the world I mean you know and I started like keeping a little diary of like the places that I didn't know that was a thing it's called DXing which is listening for distant stations and I found out there were other people doing it too and we would kind of exchange like well hey I got a station from such and such but yeah but I heard a station from it was kind of cool they don't do that anymore. Well, Donna, thank you so much for being on our very first show. I and mean, this makes it really special. Not uh, worthy. We were gonna, not worthy. 
<laughs> we were going to do a, another segment on the song, The Garden. And I know the song, that song is very special to you. Yes. Um, and we were going to kind of analyze that song and, and talk more about it. I think we're going to save that for the next show, just yes. for time. Thank you so much for having me on. I hope I didn't talk too much. Like I said, I used to be a DJ, so I get paid to talk. But I hope I was halfway interesting. I want to wish your show a lot of good luck. And I want to thank you so much for having me as thank a you. guest on your first one. Love you, Donna. Love you. Thanks Thank again. You. You Thank soon. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, and um, anything you'd like to add, Dan, to uh, our, our first, very first Two Guys Talking Rush episode? Uh, I'm over the moon that we're doing this. I think this is fantastic. I want to just keep it going for as long as we possibly can. And yeah. uh, for those few of you out there who are watching, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this this wasn't the technical disaster I thought it was going to be. This was not not too bad. Yeah, no, it wasn't that bad at all. And uh, if anybody's interested in upcoming shows, you can just go to uh, twoguystalkingrush.com. Um, and, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. And I think that the essence of the show is just purely about the fans. And um, I can't wait to have other Rush fans on the show to, yeah. to discover what and how and why they got into Rush, because everybody has ha ha has their own story uh, relating to mm -hmm. Rush and, and what Rush means to them. But it's all good. All right, Dan, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Have a good night. You too, man. Peace. Leave. <laughs>